I'm Paula Whitaker. My book is A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose, and you are watching Author's Voice. Good afternoon and welcome to A House Divided on Author's Voice, the virtual book signing network. My name is Bjorn Skaptison and I am your host for this afternoon's show. Uh, part of the virtual book signing network is an interactive chance for you to meet authors here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago and participate in a live book signing. You can do that by asking questions. You do that by clicking the button on your viewer there. And you do it by purchasing the book. The book we're featuring today is A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose. The author is Paula Whitaker, and uh, it is published by Potomac Books, which is an imprint of the University of Nebraska Press. It's 291 pages. It's illustrated and it is $32.95. Now, our author today, Paula Tarnapol Whitaker, has worked as a freelance writer and editor for many years. She previously worked for the Washington Post and as a foreign service officer in Costa Rica. She earned a bachelor's and master's degrees in international studies from Johns Hopkins University. She lives in Alexandria, Virginia, where she met Julia Wilbur, while volunteering with Alexandria Archaeology. So, welcome Paula Whitaker to Author's Voice. Archaeology, welcome. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting Paula. me. And first, before we even get into uh, too deep into the book itself, tell us a little bit about the book, A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for purpose. How did you come to meet Julia Wilbur and write this book? So as you mentioned, I mm -hmm. have been living in Alexandria and mm -hmm. I started doing volunteer work on the Union hospitals in the city. As you know, Alexandria was Union occupied from the beginning of the Civil War to the end and there were 32 hospitals. So along the way I came across um, some commentary from Julia Wilbur. She had been visiting the hospitals. It turned out that she had come from Rochester, New York to Alexandria in 1862 um, and was visiting patients along the way. So once I sort of got into the bits about the hospital, then I started realizing it was part of a diary and I started looking at her diary, transcribing the diary, trying to find out what, what brought her here, what she did in Alexandria, what she did after the war, and the book was born. <laughs> it's a voluminous archives, is it not? Well, she kept a diary for 50 years, yeah. and there are also some letters and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, I, I use it as a foundation. I didn't want to, I mean, even though I, I love transcribed, you know, annotated letters and diaries and that sort of thing, I really want it to be more of a narrative. So I use it as the basis and then kind of the, I guess, second character, if you will, is Alexandria and Washington during this really critical time. So there's a lot of other kind of archival things based on, you know, what else was going on. Right, right. Well, we'll get to Alexandria in a few minutes, but one, I think the first, uh, the first really fascinating geographical character in your book is Rochester, right, New York. Right, for sure. Um, and so tell us a little bit about, you know, Julia's from, or she comes from Rochester, New York, to Alexandria. Uh, but Rochester is a very special place in the early 19th century. What are some of the characteristics of that community, and how did it affect Julia? Well, it ended up that it was a real boom place. It was growing. There were new ideas. People were coming, going. Um, that sort of thing in terms of social movements. Temperance began there. From temperance came abolition and women's rights. Seneca Falls was nearby, you know, where the Seneca um, you know, movement began in the 1840s. And Julia became kind of part of all that. She started teaching when she was 29 in the city and was mostly living on her own, sometimes with family members, sometimes in different boarding houses, and really um, 
I guess, pushed herself to avail herself of the different you know, ideas and movements and opportunities that were going on. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so for a long time, Julia was a teacher. Right. Primary school number four, school number four. Yeah, she kind of moved around. Yeah, but moved those around were, yeah, but in those Rochester. Were some of, right. Now, what was primary education like by the time she got into it? So um, it was really kind of in its beginning stages that, that you know, the idea of the common, the Horace Mann, the common school movement, that you would have public school for all. Mm -hmm. um, they started out with male teachers. They started realizing very quickly that, hey, you know, here is this great pool of women that we could pay less, and they'll maybe <laughs> complain a little bit less. And mm -hmm. so um, many single women, you know, found that as a as a vocation. So she was one of them. Um, you know, she kind of went up and down how she liked being a teacher. She was very aware of the pay differential that women were paid less than men, and actually publicly complained about that to the New York State Teachers Association, along with Susan B. Anthony a fellow teacher. So her activism was kind of starting, you know, even when she was, um, you know, even before the war when she was still kind of a working mm -hmm. woman. Yeah, she had this professional activism right. uh, before she even got deeply into, into abolition. But it, it brings one other uh, idea or one other interesting idea about Rochester to it. So you just mentioned Susan B. Anthony, right. her colleague. Right. In, in teaching, and so many of the other names that just pop. Right. Uh, Most notably, Frederick Douglass, Frederick of course. Frederick Douglass, right. uh, Amy Post mm -hmm. uh, was there, and right. a number of other people encountered Julia during her life. Her activism brings her in touch with all of these characters. Right. Mm -hmm. and one of the things I sort of point out in the book is that she wasn't a leader in the, in the way of kind of getting up on stage and organizing meetings, but she, was, she showed up. You know, she was always kind of there uh, through thick and thin um, and uh, just kind of trying to do what she could do. Mm -hmm. And now she's, and then she wrote everything down. Right. Mm -hmm. and that was maybe her biggest contribution, little do we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so she was an abolitionist. She became an abolitionist in this circle of abolitionists. But uh, as you mentioned before, abolitionism came with a bunch of attached uh, different attached activisms. Uh, for instance, the temperance movement. Right. And uh, to what extent do, do those two movements seem to, at least in Julia's experience, intertwine? Well, I think it started getting women aware that they, um, that they had a role to play in the public sphere. In the public sphere. It started out that um, you know, temperance was women um, who were really Impacted by um, by the you know the growth of of alcoholism, and Susan B. Anthony is a good example. I mean, she became active in temperance and then started seeing that. Well, wait a second. Why aren't women having more of a role in um, you know in being able to be active in this movement? And so started kind of moving into women's. You know, into women's issues, you know, abolition and temperance. I don't see like you know quite as much of a uh, you know direct intersection, except that women started getting more politically attuned to what they could do and what their voices could contribute. And right. in that way, they were connected. And when we look at the history of the temperance movement, we look at a social problem that directly right. affected women, and they found that they had the power to do right. something about right. it. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then abolition probably right. made sense. Right, and so, um, you know, there were, a num you know, obviously there were, um, many abolition organizations, but one included the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. So that was a, you know, an all-women's group that um, formed in the early 1850s, and Julia became active in okay. that group. And then, yes, she, one of her, one of her best neighbors was Frederick Douglass, right? Yeah, not neighbor per se, but definitely <laughs> someone who she came in contact, contact with. with yeah. yeah, and you know, first it was kind of interesting. And in, um, in the eighteen mid eighteen forties, when he first comes to Rochester to give a talk, there's an actually an ad in the paper, you know, a little notice in the paper that the quote elegant eloquent fugitive slave will be giving a talk at Tallman Hall, which by the way still stands in downtown yes. Rochester, okay. and um, she kind of notes that and doesn't really know what she's getting herself into. But then over time, um, really comes to admire him, um, you know, visits him, uh, briefly teaches his daughter, Rosetta. Um, you know, 
advocates for you know kind of what's going on with the newspaper. The Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society helps fund his newspaper in Rochester, and really to, till the end of both of their lives, they remain you know certainly not like in close contact, but in in sporadic but regular contact. Right, definitely colleagues and, right, and people yeah. that, that knew each other. Right. Uh, yeah, you brought up uh, Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, and then also, I only wrote down W-Y-N-A-S-S, -S, I right. forget what, that, what that's Western for. Western New York Anti-Slavery Western New York yes. Anti-Slavery Society. And uh, so these are, these are two core societies for the, the that apply to Julia and to and have very effective abolitionists. Right. I mean that said, it's not like Rochester was just, you know, filled with people, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, they were still a, a small minority of, you know, not only Rochester but really any any city, you know, any northern city. But nonetheless, they were active and they were raising money and um, bringing in speakers and you know kind of reserving the large public halls of the city for lectures and that sort of thing. So I mean they were definitely very visible. And it was something that a person could go to. Exactly. Was, even if a person didn't agree, it was entertainment. Right. And uh, and rhetoric right. was entertainment. Right. At the yes, time. yes, some very long speeches that people listen to. <laughs> that people just right. listen to the speech. Well that brings me up to something I wanted to share with uh, with the people who are watching today because we are Abraham Lincoln Bookshop and we have this great stuff. Uh, and it's all for sale, by the way, if you want to you buy it. But one of the things that Julia and her colleagues in the Rochester, Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society decided they would do to raise money was, was what? This autograph? Right. They, um, there was a craze of um, collecting autographs of famous people and so they came upon this as a fundraising idea where they would write letters to various famous abolitionists, uh, including Harriet Beecher Stowe, that was kind of their, you know, their prize signature, if it will, and put it together in a book, you know, sort of like a coffee table book, you know, excellent for gift giving, and, um, and sell it. And they did two editions and they were able to raise money. And that is why we have this to show to you because that kind of effort was a very popular effort at the time. It was a very popular way to raise money. And what this is, what you're looking at now, is Autograph Leaves of Our Country's Authors. It was published in 1864 to benefit the Baltimore Sanitary Fair. And again, it is a collection of facsimile reproductions of manuscript, uh, of manuscript letters, and including autographs and signatures. Uh, and the most famous one is, of course, this is the first reproduction of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And uh, I won't get into the entire long story, but also it is the, the source or the reason for what we call the bliss copy of the Gettysburg Address. The people who, who uh, solicited the address from Lincoln uh, put it in there. And you can see, yeah, we, we're showing some examples of, uh, of what they look like. Very popular, kind of book to be published because that was what people back then wanted. They wanted to see the hand right. of famous people. And don't forget, they could maybe they could see illustrations, but they couldn't see photographs of these people, except you know, a carte de visite, you know, a little bit later right. on. But I mean, mm -hmm. this was a way, this sort of an immediate way of connecting with famous people. Right before the right. Uh, before a photograph could right. be uh, uh, promulgated. And again, in all of these books, the, the frontispiece will often be a lithograph right. with a signature. Signature, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and the war came. As the Lincoln war came, said. right. Uh, and, and the war came, and, and Julia moved on down to Alexandria. What drew her to Alexandria? What got her up out of Rochester and moving to Alexandria? Well, first of all, um, and part of her struggle, I guess you would say, is that um, at the time when war broke out, she was actually in a personal crisis. Um, she had been teaching, she had been having this active life. In 1858, uh, one of her sisters died in giving birth, and there was a toddler, um, an infant, and her toddler both survived. So it was decided that Julia would take care of the infant. And her name was, or not the infant, the toddler, her name was Frida, and Frida really became the daughter that like Julia never had and never would, and she just became like very attached. 
Well, about a year and a half later, the girl's father, you know, which in retrospect we would say, sure, why not, you know, reclaimed his daughter. And Julia just really kind of went off the rails. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's even things in her diary where she says, you know, the disunion of the country doesn't bother me. There's too much disunion in my own home. Mm -hmm. So um, she was really kind of, you know, suffering, I guess you'd say. Um, in 1862, just when she's starting to kind of emerge a little bit, this group, the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, which before the war had been funding, Frederick Douglass had been funding fugitive slaves, decided to um, see if they could get somebody to come down to, they weren't even sure what they were gonna do yet, but you know, maybe fund somebody to teach or help do relief work or something, maybe in Washington, we're not exactly sure what, and they approached her to see if she was interested. And it came at the right time because, yes, she was interested. So she came down in October of 1862, originally to Washington, with some letters of introduction to members of the National Freedmen's Relief Association, thinking she would stay in Washington. When she got to Washington, they said, oh, no, you really need to go to Alexandria. The situation is way worse there. And she kind of gamely said, OK. Mm -hmm. And without really any idea what she was going to do, she you know, crossed the river and, um, and settled in and just started working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a question. A question, We great. have a question from uh, Charles Lenhart in Rochester, New York. Oh, okay. And uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you very much. And uh, hi, Paula. This is Charles from uh, near Rochester. Uh, helped Paula on the book and is Julia's first Yes, that, that, is, that, he was, that was one of the joys of working on this book was to be able to come in contact with Charles and a couple of other descendants. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted someone to do the book uh, that you have done since I first discovered my cousin around 2004 and heard quite a few historians who knew of Julia say a book should be written about her. Uh, and then, and then uh, Charles asks, are you going to mention some of her interactions with African-American author Harriet Jacobs or with Harriet Tubman? And indeed, by the time she gets to Alexandria, well, we definitely need to talk a lot about Harriet Jacobs. Harriet Jacobs, yeah. yeah. I mean, they do, she does have some contact with Harriet Tubman, but Harriet Jacobs becomes truly an ally and a friend the rest of her life. Um, Harriet Jacobs, um, of course, had escaped slavery herself in North Carolina and um, had come up north in the 18, uh, 1840s. When she wrote a story about her experience, kind of one of the most notable, notable things about it was to escape slavery. She um, literally remained in her town in an attic that family members you know, had created a hiding place for almost seven years. It's kind of hard to fathom. Um, the two of them um, briefly came in contact in the 1840s because Harriet Jacobs lived in Rochester for about a year. Her brother was also in Rochester, kind of drawn into the Frederick Douglass orbit. Um, and then um, Harriet came down to Alexandria in January of 1863, so about three months after Julia came. She was sent by the New York Friends as kind of a relief agent. Um, they, after a little bit of sort of tentative kind of jockeying, kind of how are we gonna work together, particularly on Julia's part, I would have to say, they ended up realizing how much more power they had together. Um, so together, they really were advocates for the people um, who were escaping slavery, coming into Alexandria as a union-held territory. And yeah, what are some of the details of, of that? What did they accomplish, or what were they trying to accomplish in helping the freed people? Well, um, they were trying to sort of whatever the need was, that's what they were trying to do. So um, when they, uh, the first thing was clothing. I mean, people were literally coming with like barely the clothes on their backs. And so both of them would solicit um, donations from up north and they set up a clothing room on, in, a, in a house on Washington Street, which still stands in Alexandria. Um, they would advocate for better conditions, for better health, for better housing. Um, they, the, the freedmen were coming into the city. Um, the Union Army was officially, quote, responsible for them, but I mean, they were basically like on a list of 10 priorities, number 11. I mean, they were just really not being given the due that they, that they needed. Um, when they were hired, particularly the men, um, you know, to work, you know, wages were late, if at all, and then they, you know, people were complaining, oh, why do these people want these, give, you know, these handouts, that sort of thing. So um, sometimes what they needed to do was go around to make sure that wages were being paid, you know, either by individuals or by the government. 
um, there was a situation where um, the uh, it, it, there was a movement to take some, there was a, a smallpox hospital had been established south of Alexandria. One of the doctors had this idea, oh, I know what we could do with some of the orphans that we don't really know what else to do with. We'll stick them in the smallpox hospital. And the women, you know, Harriet and Julia are like, no, that is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they had to go to the military governor. This was one of the first times that they kind of go to the, you know, person in authority to protest, to say this is just not right. And they were successful, and they're kind of right, uh, you know, you know, in sort of a letter. You know, they're very nervous beforehand. I mean, they're sort of really in all a titter, and then they realize that, you know, we could do this. And so that was actually a very empowering experience. They weren't always so successful. Sometimes when they tried to kind of go against authority, authority won. But they realized that, um, you know, a, a role that they had was that they could be the voice of people who did not have a voice to, you know, always to advocate for what, you know, what they needed. So they're definitely. They're definitely advocates, yeah. and as opposed to being uh, some of the people that had really sharply defined job descriptions. For instance, at, the, at this time in Alexandria, there are many nurses, right. as we saw in the, the Mercy Street, sure. Heroines of Mercy Street by right. Dr. Toller, uh -huh. uh, or, the, or the TV show. Uh, also people who are working directly with the Sanitary Commission or the U.S. Right. Christian Commission. But Julia and Harriet are a little bit outside that order. They are order, sort of outside they? of it. They mm -hmm. are very much kind of defining it as they go, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah they didn't even move into a, right. a structure that already existed. Right. They kind and of the thing that's sort of interesting is that earlier on, Julia had made some attempts to go with some more established organizations. There was a possibility of being part of the Port Royal you know, experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, and if she had, she would have fit into like a defined structure. By not doing that, she really did have to sort of be a little bit more creative and maybe entrepreneurial and, you know, ultimately really made a difference. Mm -hmm. Did they find, uh, did Harriet and Julia find any really effective or noteworthy partners in power? Um, well, they or found... Or mostly antagonists. <laughs> well, they definitely had a couple of antagonists. Yeah. Now, the provost marshals was the, peop was the you know, of course, the, pe the people who kind of maintained, co quote unquote, contraband affairs. Mm -hmm. These people kind of rotated in and rotated out. Now, when uh, there was one who was more sympathetic, one less sympathetic. The military governor, who really wanted to kind of keep control over everything, mm -hmm. He was generally not sympathetic, but he would often sort of, you know, do things that were, were positive. Um, their villain was a, um, a civilian, I, the superintendent of contrabands, a man named Albert Gladwin. He had come a few months before Julia did, and um, he, uh, you know, he was nominally responsible for Friedman's affairs. What they found was that he would be kind of bullying to the people below him, you know, try to charge rent when he wasn't supposed to, kind of threaten people, bully people, while he kind of kowtowed to the folks in charge. And so they're constantly figuring out how to, you know, combat, get around, uh, figure out, you know, complain about Gladwin. Right, right. Um. So yeah, they have somebody that they have to right. to box with. Right. And, uh, but uh, uh, it would be nice if they had somebody that would uh, that that would help. But they seem to they seem to just be gifted at working the levers of of power. Right. You know, I mean, they this being so, persistent. Yeah. I mean, you know, the New York Friends, for example, came you mm -hmm. know came down and um, they were you know, kind of helped maybe intervene a little bit at one point for better conditions. So, I mean, they were able to sort of find some, you know, some support when they could. But generally, it was the two of them, you know, as far as I have found, really trying to figure this thing out, at least for Alexandria. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, she, she's a pretty descriptive writer, mm -hmm. right? Julia is a pretty vividly descriptive. What does she have to say about Alexandria and the way it looks and the way it feels and what kind of world it is? It's a dirty old town, <laughs> and it probably was. Yeah. Um, you know, conditions were not good. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, sanitation was a little iffy. I mean, the climate, everything else. So, um, you know, people are just, you know, literally thousands of people are coming through. Um, and so she never really um, praises its aesthetics, I'd have to say. <laughs> But there she stays, yeah. and uh, sometimes she seems like she uh, 
is at least a woman who prefers comfort right. and, and nice yeah. things, yet she's willing to throw herself yeah. in. Yeah, I mean, and she goes, to, she, you know, she travels to Washington a lot. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. she'll stay for a few days with friends that she's made um, or visit some of the sites. Uh, there's, you know, in the summers of um, each, let's say, 63 and 64, she spends time, she goes back to upstate New York kind of as a break. In fact, at 64, she's actually sick when she, you know, she takes ill when she's up there. Um, and that becomes something that she ends up doing her whole life, that she, you know, stayed in Washington after the war through her death in 1895, but often over the summer, or, you know, some part of the summer would go to upstate New York or would travel. Um, you know, she ended up making friends in Philadelphia. She spent some time there. Uh, at one point, she goes to the beach at Atlantic City and kind of is in the ocean for the first time. So but she's also able to kind of enjoy herself. Right. Yeah, and even when she's in Alexandria during the war, one of the... Um, uh, things that she loves doing is going visiting, you know, battlefield sites or going to Mount Vernon or going out to Fairfax. And uh, so that's something she's able to she do as well. She writes about these visits. Yeah, and, and quite yeah, makes, a lot of detail, yeah. right. We have another question that came from the internet. Uh, Sam in San Antonio, Texas is watching. Thank you, Sam. Um, good question. How would you compare Julia Wilbur's source diary? with that of Mary Boykin Chestnut, whose famous diary I greatly enjoyed. Um, you know, it, it, did Wilbur keep the actual diary and then write it up later? That, uh, or, or is it day-to-day uh, uh, -day kind right. of Right. Well, she actually had two sets of diaries, which I learned mm -hmm. a couple years into the project. <laughs> um, she kept a little pocket diary. Um, a little leather bound thing that you know you it was commercially available but then as I learned when I went up to Haverford to see the originals that she also kept kind of a um, sort of a, a packet of papers that she would kind of make as her own diary she would not you know they weren't predated I mean she would date them herself and um, I believe they were you know somewhat concurrent I mean every so often she would say you know wrote up the last few days or something like that but mm -hmm. you know it was pretty much like a contemporaneous thing that she would she would keep did she also have a collection of letters that um, the only letters that I know of are um, letters that she sent to her colleagues you know back in Rochester mm -hmm. the originals are um, at the University of Michigan there's also some letters at the University of uh, there's some at the University of Michigan, there's some at the University of Rochester. Um, I only know of one personal letter um, that has remained, which is a letter to one of her sisters uh, that records kind of her feelings after the assassination of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So we don't have personal letters, but we do have her personal thoughts in the diaries. Well, that's, this, you, you, uh, uh, you beat me to a question I was going to ask. The war ends, uh -huh. and did, uh, what did Julia notice about the Lincoln assassination, how, about how things changed then? Uh, did she give you a very vivid writing either in the letter or the diary about that? Well, um, about the, kind of the aftermath. About the assassination. Um, or uh, yeah, yeah. The, the aftermath. Well, she um, was in um, Alexandria the night that Lincoln was assassinated. She, by the way, had moved to Washington a couple months before. She was doing kind of similar relief work in Washington. She moved there in February of 1865. But, you know, with everything going on with the end of the war and kind of all the joy and all that sort of thing, she makes a conscious effort, oh, I need to go over to Alexandria. They're going to have a, they're having a procession to sort of, you know, celebrate everything. So on the day of April 14th, she um, takes the boat over. There's you know steamships that go back and forth um, between the two cities all the time, and um, in fact the photograph that, that's kind of on the screen at the back of the um, on the book cover is um, taken that day when a group of people are celebrating. The next morning, wake up, mm -hmm. bells are tolling, Lincoln is shot. So from joy to despair. And um, she spends a couple more days in Alexandria just going around, just seeing the grief among particularly the freedmen, you know, the African Americans, seeing sort of muted reactions, um, not necessarily grief, among some of the white locals. Um, and then when she heads back to Washington, um, she spends the week, as did everybody, just sort of really caught up in you know, the funeral procession and going to visit his body and just you know, really trying to figure out what comes next. And this letter to her sister was written a couple of weeks later, and they're still sort of in this shock of you know, of this aftermath. Right, right. Uh, still kind of in that, right. that fugue, that, that right. shock. Um, 
Well, but she didn't go home, did she? She did not. She go did home. not go home. Right. Yeah, we're, we don't have too much time left, but I but I do want to touch on a, a very fascinating part of her life that takes up a significant portion of the book after right. after the war. Uh, she stays in Washington. What does she do there? Why does she stay? Well, I think she realized that an independent life was in Washington. It wasn't back in Rochester, you know, as a member of the family, kind of taking on the duties of the family. So she worked for a couple of years in the Freedmen's Bureau as a visiting agent is what it was called. And she had like a district of Washington that she would be responsible for. Um, she uh, started realizing that this wasn't going to last much longer. And if she wanted to stay in Washington, she needed to find another job. So here she is at, let's see, at this point, roughly um, 50 years old, trying to find work as a woman. Mm -hmm. um, this was the first generation of some female government employees, and she really pushed to get a job in the government. She ended up working at the patent office as a clerk. And she worked for um, until shortly before her death in 1895, when she was almost 80 years old. So she continued working she for the patent office. Yeah, for the she patent was office. Almost 80 years right, old. exactly. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you know, kind of maintaining a life involved in suffrage, involved in lectures, involved in you know just various other things, but um, also complaining about having to go to work every day. <laughs> well, one of the people who still around her at the time. And let's take a look at one other artifact that we have here. And this is a deed from the uh, District of Columbia uh, uh, a recorder of deeds signed by her colleague, Frederick Douglass. And uh, so there it is. Yeah, we're, the folks at home are getting a good look at that uh, Frederick Douglass signature as the recorder of deeds of Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, what was their life like? Not like they were together all the time, but they're, now they're living again in the, same, in the same orbit together, right? Right. I don't want to, like, overplay their relationship. I mean, it wasn't like they were, you know, great friends or anything like that. But, I mean, they were definitely, you know, she maintained a sort of social acquaintanceship with him. Um, one time she talks about going to visit when he is um, just distraught about what's going on with the, um, the fall of the Freeman's Bank. That was in the 1870s. Frederick Douglass, of course, remained very active in women's rights till his death, and as did Julia. They died actually um, the same year. Or within, yeah, they both died in 1895. So they were, um, you know, kind of <laughs> of the same generation, really. Right. Moving very in the same circles. Very different again. experiences, but, you know, still some common ones as well. Yeah. Now, even though Julia was absolutely a, a progressive for her era, I guess she predates the progressive era, but, uh, uh, but how did her... How did the war and how did the, ex the experiences of actually being down there change her views on race? Uh, did, did they change? Did they become more, uh, uh, more determined? What? Well, um, I think when she was in Rochester, it was a little bit more theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, Rochester did not have a large African-American population. I mean, you could sort of say in theory that you're, you know, uh, you know for something. And when she came down, you know, I think it was a little bit of a, of a dose of reality. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say that she ever uh, totally shed, you know, there was some feelings of, oh, I know what's better for people, you know, that sort of thing. I don't think she ever totally shed that. Um, but certainly more than most people, once she started realizing people um, across the color line, you know, were as, you know, we're human, mm -hmm. were, you know, we need to work together. Um, it's not just, you know, quote unquote, white people helping black people escaping slavery. It was people making brave decisions on, you know, to do that, to make that decision. Um, you know, that really uh, kind of formed what she was thinking. Do you think Harriet Jacobs had a had a influence in that part of her? Oh, life? definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. And she rem she continued to have friendships across the color line for the rest of her life, and that was not all that common in those days. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it was worshiping, eating with, uh, you know, spending the evenings with people of, you know, both black and white. Okay. okay. Well, we're going to need to wrap this up in, in a few minutes here, but I do want to uh, pay tribute to it, at least one thing that's going on here in 2017. A lot of really great writing 
about these activities that are going on in Northern Virginia uh, in uh, the later, uh, or during the war, uh, and how, how uh, freed people are taking their first steps toward freedom and, and getting some help or not very much help, while in the same place, soldiers recovering from right. sickness, soldiers recovering. And so we do have, and we've been lucky to have two fine books on the subject in the last year. Of course, your uh, Civil Life in Uncivil Times and Dr. Pamela Toller's The Heroines of Mercy Street, the companion volume to right. that fine television program. And so we have them both in stock, and uh, anybody at home who's interested in getting a copy of Julia Wilbur's life is probably also going to want to take a look at the bigger picture of what was happening in the hospitals um, and uh, in Pam Toller's book, The Heroines of Mercy Street. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do thank you for joining us, and I thank Potomac Books and University of Nebraska Press for helping to send you here. Uh, the book is A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time uh, by uh, Paula Whitaker. Uh, the subtitle, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose. Potomac Books, 291 pages. It's finely illustrated. $32.95. Now coming, well, thank you very much, Paula. Thank you for having me. And, uh, Thank you for everyone for join, at home for joining us on An Author's Voice, A House Divided. Thank you to the staff of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop for making this happen. A special shout out today uh, for our solo flyer, technical director Matt Blanton, who managed, uh, managed to get this entire show almost all by himself. Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, join us next time on Author's Voice. <laughs>